Welcome to JAG Talk, a podcast series featuring Navy JAG community experts. Listen to in-depth discussions about different legal fields and hear insights and lessons learned from practitioners across our enterprise. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special edition of our podcast. I'm Lieutenant Greg Lines. Today's episode is going to be a good one, folks. We've put together an all-star lineup of guests who are coming to answer the question, VLCs, where are they now? Make sure your headphones are charged. Here we go. Well, my next guest is joining us from sunny San Diego, California. Please welcome Lieutenant Commander Adrian Baldoni. Uh, welcome, ma'am. Hi. Um, could, could you just walk us through real quick kind of your journey through the JAG Corps um, so far to this point? Sure. Um, I am tipping over to 15 years at this point of active duty. Um, so I joined the JAG Corps, as most people have, as through the student program. Um, from there, I did my training, and then I went off to a NILSO, NILSO Midland, and there I was a legal assistant and um, a defense attorney. Um, I did basically a year in both, and that was very exciting. Uh, and then from there, I went off to the USS Nimitz, where I was the mini judge, the disciplinary officer there. I did two years, a nine-month deployment over 500 NJPs. Um, so we were pretty busy um, and like 17 summary courts marshals. So that was fun. And then from there, I had oral orders actually to go be a defense attorney again, this time in San Diego, where my then fiance was. Um, but then I got an email saying, call me about your orders. Nothing big from Commander Wallace, so now Captain Wallace. Um, and then was told that I was pulled for VLC. So I didn't quite know what I was getting myself into at that point, but I didn't really think I had a choice to get out of it. So um, at, the, at that point, I just proceeded forward um, and went down to the VLC uh, in San Diego. From there, I did actually three and a quarter years as a VLC there. I uh, rolled down to be the um, a trial counsel and then the assistant senior trial counsel in San Diego. I did that for three and a half years um, in the Southwest AOR. Then from there, I moved over to TCAP, which is where I'm at now, the trial counsel assistance program, Detachment San Diego. And I'm just closing off three years of doing that. And now I'll be headed up to the Northwest um, to set up uh, to be the chief special trial counsel for the Office of Special Trial Counsel in the Northwest. So I'll be setting up the Northwest shop, um, including our detachment in Hawaii. So I've been really working pretty much with special victims since 2014. So that's a little overview. Looking back, um, what were your kind of initial thoughts when you were told, hey, you're gonna be uh, a a victim's legal counsel? (laughs) I'll be honest and say, uh, from being a, a defense attorney and then over to be basically just the disciplinary officer on the Nimitz, I was just kind of like, this is interesting to me. I'm not sure exactly what's going on. I did reach out to my military justice mentors and they too were kind of unsure, which surprised me, right? Because you don't kind of expect the 06s to kind of know what's going on. Um, but even they were a little unsure of how it was going to go. But, you know, we kind of just like by blind faith, just kept walking forward to see how and, and you know, I sort of embrace the bloom where you're planted type of thing. Uh, and it didn't really provide me much clarity when I showed up, to be honest, because I always kind of joke. I showed up and I had a computer and a tissue box and I knew what to do with one of them. Um, and that was the that was the computer. We didn't even like I don't even think we had case law yet. I don't think Kastenberg was out of the, out of the Air Force just yet. Um, let alone discovery or motions or like anything. So it was just kind of a, it was nuts and it was fun all at the same time. So, I mean, obviously in your role now um, at at TCAP, I'm sure you're tracking, you know, the the, the ever-changing landscape of of things affecting victims, particularly um, MRE 513. And so do you think that your experience as a VLC kind of carries over now, still years later, in the way that you are looking at kind of the way the system is is running and how we're training folks and and, and how everything relates back to victims? I think that's a really great question. It's weird because I didn't expect to get called upon so many times to like provide the victim's perspective. Like it's kind of like being the female in the room and wondering wondering what the women think type of thing. So I kind of didn't expect to be called upon so many times to say like to give 
special victims training or to like be in this like sort of niche of special victims. Guess I didn't realize that there was anything that was lacking. Like when you look back on it and you step back and you look at the levels of experience of people, there are a lot of people who really don't have special victims interaction. And to kind of see that perspective. And I, I guess the one thing I learned from representing, I think I had about I had almost, if not a hundred clients as a VLC over my three and a quarter years. Out of that hundred, I realized like, you know, it's like the eggshell plaintiff to a certain degree, not to say that every egg is fragile, right? I have some very well-preserved eggs that are not fragile at all and wouldn't break if dropped from the top of a building. You take the victim where they're at and don't assume that, that things are as you quote would expect it to be and then to kind of kind of like throw in the layer of people within our system who may themselves have had some past trauma that are informing the way that they view the work that they do to me i feel like sometimes i'm the first one asking like what does the client want or what does the victim want some people i think look at me like i'm crazy well obviously they don't want to give their diagnoses or whatever it might be and that's just not always true right like Give the person a say so, because I can tell you one thing that happened throughout this whole process is that at some point he or she didn't have a say so, whether that was due to the accused or somebody else. Give them a say so and see what they actually want. And it surprises me when we get so far along on a particular case that nobody's asked that question. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great point. When you were coming into the program, um, what kind of things stood out to you as like the appealing aspects of it? One of my most satisfying cases was a case with a one of my clients whose case and her particular charges resulted in acquittal. It was so gratifying to know that like she was well informed of what her role and her part would be in this. And she was content with the result of it based off of what she was going in there with. And I try to remind people of this, like victims can handle pretty much anything that you throw at them as long as they are well-informed and prepared for what's being thrown at them. What were some of the bigger like legal hurdles or legal challenges that you faced um, advocating for your clients? It's tough because I don't, I didn't find the legal challenges all that big of hurdles. And that might not make sense, but like the reality is there's case law and there's rules. Sure, we were building the plane while we were flying it. Um, we had some rules that were there. The rules have changed incredibly since I would, uh, started right. as a VLC. Mm-hmm. The rules changed, the UCMJ changes. And if you look at statutory construction, that meant that the law changed, my friends. And oftentimes the rules didn't follow very quickly. But I didn't find there to be too many like legal challenges. The challenge was just sort of, I guess, in the unknown. You know, when I started, it was like, oh, the victims have these rights to privacy. And then there was a moment in time while I was a VLC where victims' privacy rights to a certain degree were almost equal, if not if not more than the accused rights to like constitutional rights to fair trials and due process, right? And then the, the case law came back. So I was in the trenches when that was happening. What made me a better attorney is thinking down the line, okay, if this argument is made right now this way, and I win this battle at this motion in this court, do I win the war for my client? Because I've represented many people whose cases got overturned on appeal, and by many, probably within two hands, but that's a lot. We shouldn't have cases that get overturned for legal error, right? But none of them have been better three years later after they like testified none of them they just were not better when it when it came down it's not it's not fun to tell them hey you know that thing that you had finality for and you've been working towards um and we closed the book on it and we won that amazing motion right yeah we're back uh and the result wasn't there and sorry about that and so i think that's where i became a better attorney a better trial counsel right like Maybe I don't argue certain things because I don't want prejudice to attach because I know that particular ruling by that judge is is what's an abuse of discretion standard. So like, okay, and like those are things as a junior attorney, I just never would have seen the forest through the trees on. You just get caught in your own little moment and ready to object based off of relevance. Um, But you're not seeing the forest through the trees that playing this down the line, this might not work out very well. And at that time, it was sometimes it wasn't working out well, and we were ebbing and flowing when it came to the case law. How did you see 
um, VLC in enriching your JAG Corps experience and helping you kind of get set up for success going forward? There are definitely like places of duty that seem great and they seem super sweet. And I wonder like how busy they'll actually be. And it's and that comes with like, the territory, whether you're a defense counsel or a trial counsel or any of it, right? It, it's like the, your purpose there is maybe not quantity, right? Maybe your purpose there is more of a quality level or there's like some craziness happening in that little niche part of the world. And if you leave, it gets anything crazier, right? So maybe you should just stay there and stay planted as an attorney because it provides some level of balance, right? Um, so, but at San Diego, not my problem. <laughs> right, right. I had a nice, uh, a, a nice uh, portfolio of clients and it was, uh, it was nice to be able to like kind of see the different span of clients um, and see the varied legal issues to be able to like, at the time I worked with um, Jim Tui, who was also a military justice guy and like, you know, to have the cerebral discussions on case law um, that was coming down the pipe and how that might impact us moving forward um, and how, how, do, how can we train each other so that they don't walk into the same like landmine or whatever it might be unwittingly um, based off of that case law. So it was nice to have the time to do that, even though I had 100 clients over that three years, like it, I still had time to like have academic large discussions and thoughts about things. I was able to also kind of keep my finger on the pulse of what actually was happening in Congress, what the C students are making our laws. And it's true, right? There's <laughs> there's a handful of JAGs out there that are now making our laws, right? Um, but to just kind of have the foresight through there and see what's on the horizon and why, what was proposed and why, where is that coming from? Is that actually a knee-jerk reaction or what does that practically mean? I, I wouldn't have had the time to to learn about the forest as a trial counsel. I had the time to learn about the forest as a VLC, which made me a better trial counsel. But even still, I was still busy, quantity was there, but that doesn't mean that like you can't have that level of quality work that like it just takes one case to make law at the end of the day. And it doesn't mean where I, there's so many cases I wanted to make law, right? My clients didn't, right? <laughs> it extends the process, but it does just take one thing. And the more informed you are as, a, as an attorney, I think that makes you a better attorney. And it made me a better trial counsel for sure. Were you in the program kind of when, when Peyton O'Brien came down? Yeah, I mean, I was in, I want to say I was in the gallery when that was going down, right? Like <laughs> from the trial yeah. level. Uh -huh. So, and I think that's, that's an interesting kind of a uh, case study example. As somebody who kind of went through that, kind of ebb and flow period was that kind of disheartening like how did you and and the other vlcs at the time kind of feel about that i remember having almost like a a backdoor conversation with my mill just brains about like oh maybe we should be careful what we wish for and then after that it was sounds like well kind of like yeah we need to be careful what we wish for sometimes right like sometimes it's kind of like there was times that my colleagues were winning on certain things and you're not sure if that's going to withstand appeal or maybe it is a win and then it but it doesn't have the intended consequence that your client was prepared to to absorb so yeah i guess as that was happening and i tend to be more of a risk averse person but i did realize you always get the question from any client what should i do right you tell them this is this can happen that can happen this can happen and then they're like well what should i do many times i did not know sort of what to say and respond to that right you i had to just make sure that they were fully aware of the consequences of walking into the field of of field of fire and a lot of times i had to turn around and just say i don't have a good should like it really kind of depends on what's within you fully knowing and i just feel like i did my job for you sir ma'am if you feel like you are prepared for everything unfortunately i don't get to know that until the end right i don't get to see that you were prepared for everything until we go through everything and we turn around and look at the carnage right if you will if there was carnage right but like yeah i don't have that ability to turn around and and or to see it exactly what's about to happen When you kind of engage in, in mentorship of, of other folks, um, be they male Jess or not, um, what what advice do you give them when considering whether or not to do the VLC program? You need to do it. Whether you're male Jess or not, I mean, even, especially almost as mil, mil, military justice, like I do think it make, made me a better attorney. 
it might not be like the, the core solid properly law textbook type of core level of, of information. But like when you start sharpening your iron, like it makes you, it truly does make you a, a better attorney um, in my mind. And that's the only thing that that's the, the biggest area I think VLC has that it's the fringes of your work and that you start sharpening that it becomes pretty powerful. You know, there's a way to be unopposing with that too, right? Like you can kind of have a lot of things in your repertoire that you can pull upon. You didn't really think that you'd be able to pull upon. I've cited cases that I was the defense attorney on and now I cite them as trial counsel or then I cite them as VLC and it's kind of crazy to come full circle. You, you kind of made law for yourself to use in the future. You never really realized that that was going to happen. Frankly, nobody did. Going out of your VLC tour into your, your subsequent tours, did you feel that um, it had set you up, you know, in terms of competition and, and, and promotion boards and whatnot? Yes, because I was in San Diego, I tried to seek out as much as I could do, right? I tried to do as many structured interviews as I possibly could do. I tried to do a lot of recruiting events for the JAG Corps. I tried to do all these things like Anything that I could do sort of to help the JAG Corps because I had that extra time. Remember, I just came off a deployment, a nine-month extended deployment from the USS Nimitz, where I was an officer of the deck. I felt like I had a ton of time. Oh, and by the way, I was like just becoming a stepmom of two kids, but didn't have the full four that my house now has, right? Mm -hmm. So like, it's amazing the amount of time I had back then. Um, but to be able to be like that sounding board or do those special projects, that's the type of stuff to seek out just to kind of do your part for either the VLC program or the JAG Corps at large. And you really can't hurt your career when you're doing those things. Even if I made like a, a crazy argument sometime, I don't feel like that's what got remembered really as the JAG Corps. Maybe that particular judge remembered it, but like, on a whole, you just you're just like, yeah, you you made it better. You made either the VLC program better, you made litigators better, you sat on mock trials, you did you raised your hand for all those things. Um, you helped the system as best as you can within your own powers. And then that just kind of like followed into the fit reps. So by like ranking board time or fit rep time, you weren't struggling to find things more than just case numbers. Yeah, it, well, two things. Um, one, first, congratulations on um, putting on a five. And, and second, I, I think two other people, um, as I've been chatting with them, have said, you know, it, it's really what you make it and, and you bloom where you're planted. And um, it, depending on what you are looking to get out of the tour, you know, should inform your, the location you choose Um and, uh, you know, can, can really shape your experience in many different ways. Mm -hmm. What would you say if you had to pick like two things, uh, were your biggest takeaways from, from your kind of total spirit experience as a victim's legal counsel? I think patience and maybe that's sort of the litigator in me. We kind of like go, 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 move, 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 move. We're very reactionary a lot of the time, not tend to be very proactive. Sometimes it does take a moment to step back and slow down and just be patient with who's within your, your realm there. Um, but boy, I think probably the number one thing and the thing that like I kind of continue to carry with me are sort of the relationships with my other VLC. People I never thought I would, and I probably wouldn't have crossed paths to be truthful, I don't think there's there's definitely a lot of the other people within my VLC program. I don't think I ever would have seen been in the same workplace as. Um, but we were a conglomerate of people and we still are. I think if you look at the makeup of VLC, they come from all walks of life, different experiences. Some of them are like they're going to see VLC as a, as a ramping down tour. And some of them are going to see VLC as a ramping up tour, but depending on where they came from. If I didn't have them to sort of talk to, to vent to, to not hold it against me, if I might have acted a little like insensitive once in a while when I spoke to them about something, I wouldn't have had anybody to talk to because I can't. You can't bring this stuff home, right? You can. You can do you can do it to a certain degree where you're just like, you know, I feel validated today or I feel like I did a good job or something like that. But it's never truly like can never sort of like ask somebody to come into your world and be on your same level. They're either there or they're not. Uh, and my VLC people were always there. They understood and they wouldn't hold things against me. They weren't going to hold something that I said against me because I was venting about a particular client. 
Um, and then I was able to be there and vent about a particular client, which is great, right? <laughs> like it's kind of nice to have a sounding board. But I will say I got I had a very sensitive one of my first cases as a trial counsel was a stalking case. And if I hadn't been in BLC, I would have never been able to handle that victim the way that I did. But, you know, it was kind of like almost being back there without representing her. And also being able to say, I cannot advise you on what to do. Um, you know, I know very clearly where my lines are. Uh, and I know, and I'm going to tell you ahead of time, what's going to get disclosed to the defense. Because I know what's going to get close to, disclosed to the defense. Because I've learned all of that already. Um, I'm not going to have to learn it on your case. You will not be my learning case that causes me to learn a bad lesson. That's the only way I kind of like handled that client, I think, is because I had my VLC time where I was just very well informed and I had it all out and I had a strong base and foundation of other VLC who held me up when I when I didn't want to. Looking forward for um, your career, um, do you see kind of any... If, if you were given the chance, right, in, in whatever capacity, um, you know, of leadership, would you would you be interested in coming back to the VLC program? I would. Don't tell the other litigators, though. No, I'm kidding. Um, I'd, I'd go back to the VLC program. I'd also go back to be a defense attorney. I just find value in all of them. Um, and sometimes, like, sometimes I find it funny, like, on the trial counsel side, like, you know, I have to turn to a VLC and like the, the VLC will say something like, oh, we don't know how to represent our client because we don't have X, Y, Z from the trial counsel. And I kind of have to look at them and be like, really, really? Come on. I've been there and I know what you have and I know what I had and I know what you have now. Right. And so um, I think sometimes the VLC are like, dang it. Like, yeah, I know you know what I'm what I'm going through, right? And so there's there's some like there's some just even playing field there, and like you can kind of like uh you can kind of really I don't know you just kind of can call through it a lot of a lot faster. And it would be nice, at least from my own professional development, to come back to a place that has so much. And I know that sounds weird, maybe from your perspective, but from my perspective, you guys have so much, and oh, what to do with all that case law. Oh, what to do with all that authority? Like, oh, the things that you could possibly argue, the things that I haven't had the, the ability to argue as a trial counsel or something like that. But I just think that makes me a better attorney and I find it riveting and exciting. I never want to do it at the expense of a person or a party, right? So wouldn't be that that case. But it would be nice to be able to like just kind of like reach back and not and have more than that computer and tissue box. Um, and to see what we could do with that, right? Um, but at the same rate, I'd love to be on the defense side too and do the same thing, reach back and see all this stuff. Uh, but I am also very happy and satisfied that I'm going to be the um, in the Office of Special Trial Counsel because here we grow again, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and it'll be see it'll be interesting to see the the relationship between VLCs and and um, OSTC um, as, as it develops. As we look back on the 10 year anniversary of the program, um, you know, having seen its growth and, and change over the years, um, any kind of like thoughts or reflections you want to share on that? I can't believe it's been 10. I'm sure a lot of people are saying that, you know, that's half a naval career, right? Like, uh, I don't know. It just seems like like yesterday, whenever we were like when we didn't have VLC and we didn't know where our place was in the world. Um, and I remember the conversation of talking to the Kastenberg attorney. That just seems like yesterday, too. And You know, what's funny is kind of like there's something about coming from the VLC program that you can always reach back and say I was a VLC and X, Y, Z, because I've reached back to those Air Force, like the Kastenberg attorney. I've reached back there. I've reached back to NCVLI. I've reached back to these people and you're like, this is who I was back then during this time. And they're like, oh yeah, I remember you, right? Um, and you just kind of like have a, a a level of understanding that I'm not bad intentioned. Whatever I'm doing right now, like I actually am not bad intentioned, right? Um, even if I'm not a VLC anymore, because like I get your position and I get where you've been. Um, So I'm just, you know, I'm kind of, it's surreal to me to think that it's been so long because some of these things seem like yesterday. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and time flies, right? Um, And I think, um, you know, thankfully over the years, I think the, 
the recognition of, of the value add of the program has has definitely come through and um you know it's it's nice to be uh you know what some have called like a jewel of the navy right we, we feel like we we're doing something right with that program mm-hmm. how many times have people said like hey i have a murder victim's like parent like can you represent them and you're like no sorry and they're like please begging you you know there's always these like person begging for a representation. I'm sure there, if they did a study on a request for waivers from 10 years ago to today, I guarantee you there's been a lot more requests for waivers from like prosecutors or maybe even defense counsel um, over the years, though, which in which to me is indicative of the value that is seen across the board for victims legal counsel. Yeah. Well, I even had just today, um, I was at a guilty plea for, um, a client's case and uh, was talking to civilian defense counsel and they had been uh, uh, approached by somebody, um, you know, who wanted to, uh, without all the facts, you know, it seemed like they did not qualify for VLC and hadn't sought a waiver. And they, they were approaching a civilian to see if they could get a victim's legal counsel. Um, so it's interesting, I, you know, the word is out there and I think people recognize what, what benefit it could be to them. Yeah, for sure. And I can tell you as trial counsel, so many times I'd rather be able to talk to you guys um, than have to like make a concerning call to somebody who doesn't maybe understand the law that I'm about to throw at them. Uh, I just want to thank you again for um, for your time and, and, and chatting with me today. Um, definitely a lot of great perspective and, and, and lessons learned that you were able to share. Um, and it's interesting to see how and a VLC played a role in your journey um, and development within the JAG Corps. Yeah, for sure. Recommend it to anybody. I'm a big VLC champion. Um, so really, we'll, we'll always push over to you guys. And I'm just waiting for you guys to open up services to even more people. It'll be great. You have been listening to JAG Talk, a podcast series featuring Navy JAG community experts. Visit jag.navy.mil for additional chapters of this podcast series. Thank you for tuning in.